Hey, brothers and sisters, welcome back to another time of Bible teaching. We are talking about the um, the calendar, the timelines, and the appointed times of the Lord, and we're going to look at everything about prophecy. Oh, my goodness. We're going to tie all of the events of the, the first and the second coming through these feast days, looking at the agricultural harvest, looking at the wedding feast, looking at all kinds of things. We're going to walk through timelines for the Jews through the through tribulation. We're going to be walking through all kinds of things. And the thing is, the scripture tells us everything. It, there is nothing that God doesn't tell us ahead of time, because he does nothing without telling us. And we saw that in Amos 3, 7. This is still part of the introduction. There are so many things you have to understand. The problem is there's a lot of bad teaching out there. Seriously, bad teaching. It's got to come from Scripture. You've got to have Scripture references. Seriously, you do. And unfortunately, some people talk and talk and talk and maybe mention a couple of Scripture. And then they take them out of context. I love one. One of the biggest, to me, one of the biggest um, jokes is that God moved something. Um, Psalm 89, I, do, I don't alter the words that come out of my lips. If God changed something, he's not God. We talked about that in the last one. But people say, well, we know this happened based on this verse. We know this happened. No, we don't. We left off in the book of Acts. So let's open up our Bibles, and we're just going to jump right back into the book of Acts. And we're in Acts 1. We want to look through this, and because there's so much here, okay. Um, we're looking at four through eight, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, "You have heard from me." Hmm. You have heard from me. Let's go to John 14. What's this promise that they have heard from him? John 14, 15 through 18. I love John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's for it. Anyhow. And I will pray. Oh, and that's like a but. Like you do that. And I, anyhow, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So we're going to get this helper that will abide with us forever. The spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither, neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I came to you. So this spirit of truth, oh my goodness, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is truth, Messiah is truth. Truth is important, you know. Um, I got to go here real quick. Did you know that the law is truth or Torah is truth? For your righteousness is an ever uh, everlasting righteousness, and your law, that word is actually Torah. Your Torah is truth also. In Psalm 119, um, the entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. What's a righteous judgment? It's if you break this, then here is the judgment, and it's righteous because God told you ahead of time. Um, they endure forever. The word, the law, the, it's truth. It is all truth. Just put that away. Um, let's go to John 16. Again, Scripture speaks. You might not like that, but that's okay. David wrote, I mean, David wrote it. It's true. John 16, 7. Yeah, the word's been offending people for a long time. It even offends people in church. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to him, to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Mm. By the way, John 
He will convict the world of sin. What is sin? What did John tell us sin is? Sin is lawlessness. Bottom line. Lawlessness is a condition of being without Torah by choice or ignorance. All right, enough of that for now. So, um, the Holy Spirit, go to John 15, 27. John 15, 27. Messiah is the Word, and the Holy Spirit and as you will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And that's not the scripture I was looking for. But when the Helper comes to you, whom I will send to you, the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who, pro who processes from the Father, he will testify of me. So the Spirit testifies of Messiah. It's through the Spirit that you understand who Messiah is. Let's go back to Acts and see what we're, what, and get a better idea of what's really being said here. Acts 1. Understand, this is, after this, now he has spoken these things, and they watched, and he was taken up. This is the ascension. This is the last interaction that Messiah is going to have with his disciples. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. We just looked at that. For John was truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they have come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? When is this kingdom of heaven going to come? How much longer? That's the hugest question in, is in the Jews. How much longer? How much longer to this? How much longer to this? But it's the same thing we're asking today. How much longer, Lord, till you come back? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in your own, his own authority. But you shall receive power. Okay, the beautiful but is when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to get these things. You're going to understand it. It's not for you to know now, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, 10 days later. We're going to talk about that later, because that's important. It happened on Shabuot. That happened on Pentecost. Well, that's Shabuot. Shabuot. Ah, no, we'll finish with that. We're not going to go there yet. Um, times in the seasons. Does this sound familiar? It should. A lot of people, I've had people like prophecy. Oh, there's no salvation in that. I've had people, you shouldn't be talking about the rapture. You should be talking about salvation and bringing people to God. Um, Paul was only in Thessalonians for a short time. And when he sent the letter of the first Thessalonians to them, Every chapter talks about the second, about Messiah's coming, about the rapture. Paul didn't have much time to talk to them when he was there. And then when he sends them a letter, it's all about the rapture. You know, those people, they should have talked to Paul and told Paul, oh, there's no salvation in talking about the rapture. I know, I know, I'm going on and on and like this, and I, I do it kind of in jest, but there's a reason. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? We certainly do. If not, find my email on my channel. Email me. Even so, God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus. Sleeping in Jesus, that means you've died, but you're, you have eternal salvation. That you're going to wake up to life. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Um, so it's not his own words, that we who are alive and remain shall, until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will remain first. Will, will, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Do you trust Paul when he says that you will forever be with the Lord? I do. But how can you trust that if you don't believe Messiah when he wrote Torah and said, what's forever? Uh, interesting. Comfort one another with these words. I, I, I love this, you know, talking to a post-stripper. They believe in a U-turn theology, that you're going to get raptured up and come right back down, or a mid-tribber, that you're going to get raptured and come back down and all this. But let's comfort people with these words. Yeah, you got to go through all these judgments and a quarter of the world is going to die. you probably die. You're going to probably get tortured and hated and all this stuff. But, you know, let me comfort you with these words. And I'm getting a little sarcastic now. Yeah, you know, beautiful rapture verse, one of two that really people understand this, 1 Corinthians 15. But I want to go to the next verse on the next chapter. Understand when Paul wrote, he didn't have chapters and verses. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, I have no need to write to you. Same thing, same words Messiah used, times and seasons. The times and seasons, they are the appointed times of the Lord. Okay? Seasons. Go to Ecclesiastes 3.1. This is not seasons of the year. This is not... We don't need the time. We can know the season. I can see everything going on in the world, and we know it's close. We're in the season. You know, I don't mean to make fun of people, whatever. It's just my way of talking. I'm sorry. Um, you know, sometimes I offend somebody, whatever. Honestly, I'm not worried about offending people. I don't try to. Um, it is what it is. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under the sun. Any old folks out there like me, they know the bird song, turn, turn, turn. But, so there is, there is, to everything there is a season, a time for every person under heaven. A time for every purpose under heaven, a season, a zamad. This is not necessarily an appointed time, a feast day, different word. But it's not just, oh, this is the season. No, everything has a specific season. Let's go back. And we're in First Thessalonians 5. Hmm. We're not in Timothy, are we? First Thessalonians. Do this again. Five, one. So Paul's talking about the rapture and it says, but, turn, uh, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, I have no need to write to you. Why doesn't he have to write to them? Because his audience gets it. He's been teaching it. They're keeping the fast day, the, the appointed times. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote, For let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If you understand the Passover Seder, which he's talking about here, um, it was it was known that they do, there's all these rituals that just scream Messiah. And the Jews don't know why they do it. But it was always known that when the Messiah comes, he will explain, and that he did. And then he goes on talking about, for yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon the pregnant upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. You, brethren, and this is a whole thing about they and you, they and you. You don't want to be a they here. And we'll talk about this later, especially the uh, peace and safety thing. But... The dividing line is understanding the times and seasons. These feast days, these appointed times are that important. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
you know, I, I may have mentioned, I don't know if I said or not, about how the disciples were like, you know, a lot of times I'd said, excuse me, rewind. Yeah. I thought I was going to say that the, the disciples were some of the first watchers out there. The first, you know, people watching on the wall. Although they didn't call themselves watchmen. I give them that. But they're not. Do you know in the time that Messiah came and the Messiah baptized, everybody was expecting the Messiah to come at that time? Go with me back to Matthew 3. And let's walk through some things. Matthew 3. In, the, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The wilderness of Judea. So he's out there at the Jordan River and he's out of ways, okay? In those days. What days? You would have gotten it if you were living there and, and he had written this. But we'll, we'll talk about what days there were in a little bit. But he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's interesting. How did John the Baptist start? Repent. How did Messiah start his ministry talking about? Repent. And there are people out there, you don't have to repent. That's doing it your way. That's you trying to earn your own salvation. If you got rid of everybody who told you to repent in the Bible, you would have no writers left. Wow. Anyhow. Yeah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. For this is who spoke of the prophet Isaiah. For one will hear a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Um, John the Baptist is the one that's preparing the way for Messiah. He's also Elijah. But God does not do reincarnation. He came in this power of Elijah. If they would have accepted him, the beginning, the millennial kingdom would have come. And the prophecy in Malachi 4, 3, 4, would have been fulfilled that Elijah comes before the great day of the Lord. Now, so John the Baptist was clothed in camel hair with a level, level leather belt. What does that tell you? It tells you he's a prophet. That is the garb of a prophet. Around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Um, locusts would have been a carob bean, um, which is like a fake chocolate. And the wild honey is actually from a plant. Um, hmm. As cause we know that John the Baptist is a Nazarite, filled, did I say that right? Na not a Nazarene, but a Nazarite, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He can't touch honey. Yeah, it's a wild honey that comes from a plant. Anyhow, then, G then Jerusalem and all of Judea and the region around Jordan went out to him. Why would everybody come out to them? This is out in the wilderness. They're taking a journey. They're going out somewhere. Pack a lunch, honey. Maybe some fish and loaves. Hopefully we have enough. If not, maybe this guy can multiply them for us. See, this is the time of the year that they always knew the Messiah would be coming. It just is. It's the time of the year that they would have expected him. So when John's coming and doing this and they're hearing these things, they would be doing. And there would have been people there anyhow. They were expecting this. The baptism, the nikva. Yeah, they're confessing their sins and they were being baptized by, by him in the Jordan. There's not all baptisms are the same. And it's not like you're baptized, you're good to go, one and one and one and go. You know what? If you get baptized and you don't change, all you did is got wet. Seriously. They would baptize over and over for giving themselves in the sin because they continue to sin. There's also a baptism because you're changing your status. Uh, that's what Messiah did. But when they saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Coming to the baptism, he said to them, broad vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. So in other words, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not good. What were they doing there? They're looking for the Messiah. That's what they would do all the time. They, they got a candidate. Let's go out scoping out. Is this the Messiah? Broad of vipers. This is connected to the synagogue of Satan. 
These were Jewish leaders who were leading people the wrong way. Vipers, serpent, Satan. Uh, Satan. Messiah talks about this too. And that's not where we're getting ready to go. So anyhow, um, go with me now. Go, go to Matthew 4. Verse 2, actually, when Jesus was led up to the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights after he was hungry. Yeah, I'd be hungry too if I fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Then Satan, uh, Satan comes as his tempter. Da, da, da. So when, what day does Satan come on? He comes on the 40th day. If you understand the feasts and the different things that they do in Israel, you would know that this is not just any 40 days. It's a specific 40 days. Let's do this. 40 days. Maybe spelling it wrong. The 40 days, oh, I'll stay away from Perry Stone. The 40 days of Teshuvah, and you'll see it all down here. The 40 days of Teshuvah. Teshuvah means prayer and repentance. It starts at Elul 1. That is the month, the sixth month of the year, Elul, and it ends on Tishri 10. What is Tishri 10? Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. Okay? And we're going to get, we're going to talk about that because we're going to be talking, going in depth about all these different appointed times. So, hear this out. When he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, that's where he was hungry. Now the tempter, Satan, came to him. And this is where they have their conversation where eventually Messiah says, just get away. No. no. And he defeats him on Yom Kippur. That's a picture of Armageddon well into the future. You get it? It's Yom Kippur that is the end of tribulation. And we will talk about later why that is. And we'll get into more details as we dig apart and dig into each of these appointed times on God's calendar. Some more than others. Wow. 40 days. Give me a second. All right, sorry to jump around here a little bit. Um, this is a thought. Do you see this verse, Psalm songs? Um, 6 3, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. It's actually Song of Messiah, Messiah Solomon, basically the same. So much in here, and I wish I had done more, have done more work in here to understand this better. But this verse right here, I am my beloved, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flocks among the lilies. That's huge. That's like the millennial kingdom. You know what's interesting? This verse right here is specifically tied to a lull, that month, that time period. This is a Jewish website. The heart is talking about the heart of a lull. Um, so the heart of a lull comes down to this verse. A lull is an acronym for the words in Solomon 6 3. I just thought that's really cool. So Elul is Rosh Hashanah, excuse me, Elul 1 to Tishri 10. It's 40 days of praying repentance. 40 days of getting right with God. At Tishri 1 is Rosh Hashanah. It's when the gates to heaven are opened. On Tishri 10, it's when they're closed. It's Yom Kippur. It is said that the Book of Life is opened on Rosh Hashanah and closed on Yom Kippur. So much in it. And I have done video after video after video about Rosh Hashanah and why it's the only day the rapture can occur on. So now we're going to be moving in and looking at other things, other feast days, and patterns that go between them that screen everything out. So here we are. The eclipses have passed. What are people going to say now? 
Then he passed. Hmm. Which is Shavuot. Pentecost is Shavuot. In a second, let me, let me just go back to a screen there. There are four basic themes to this day. First, it is the betrothal to the Lord. Okay, we're going to talk about this in detail. Um, it is also the giving of Torah when they gave Torah. When, when you look at the, the wedding feast, the groom comes, pays a price for the bride. If the bride accepts it, she drinks from a cup. Passover, saw that. Um, you know, you must drink from this cup. If you don't drink from this cup, you have no part of me. Yeah. Anyhow. So, but then there's a ketubah, a wedding contract. That's what Torah is, the giving of the law. It's the wedding contract. Okay. Um, give me a minute. But it is also the day that the Holy Spirit comes down. See, that's when the salvation really begins. It's because at this point, people start getting that Holy Spirit. They can start understanding scriptures. They can are, the Holy Spirit can testify about Messiah because they have the Holy Spirit in them. That happens at Shabuot. You follow me? We are wheat. We are wheat. Wheat and tares. Do you want to be wheat or do you want to be a tear? We're going to look at this. Shabuot is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But see, it's not until the end of the wheat harvest that everybody gets taken into the threshing floor, into heaven. That's the millennial kingdom. And that's the theme of the Feast of Ingathering or Tabernacles. When all the weed is brought in, when, when his angels go out and gather everybody from heaven and they gather everybody. And in Isaiah, Isaiah 11, Messiah sets himself up as a banner to bring everybody into the promised land. That's the Feast of Ingathering. That's the Millennial Kingdom. That is tabernacle. But the wedding, this is the day of the betrothal. This is when Israel said, I do. If you understand the wedding, again, the groom comes, pays a price. The, the bride drinks from the cup. And when she drinks from the cup, she's saying, I do. And then what does the groom go back and do? He goes back to build a place on his father's house. What did Jesus say in Matthew 20 and John 14? See, if you don't get this and you can't put these things together and you're not in Scripture, you're going to believe whatever people tell you. And, and people are going to be screaming about how Pentecost is the rapture. You've already heard it, and it's going to get louder and louder. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Messiah. I don't want to say believe in me. You believe in Messiah. You trust Messiah. In my father's, there are many houses, there are many mansions. These are bridal chambers. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I got to prepare a place for you. What are the disciples saying? Uh, uh, uh. Bunch of guys here, Lord. Why are you talking about getting married? Where are you going? But see, in that day, he would come. There'd be a wedding contract. You have the wedding. You are married. I said, I have a wedding ceremony. You are betrothed. Then you go back to your father's house, and only your father can tell you when to come back. Joseph and Mary were in this state. That's why I said Joseph was going to put her away quietly. He wasn't going to divorce her. Gonna put, oh, excuse me, he was. He was going to divorce her, but quietly. It would have been real ugly if it was found out that she had been with a man or whatever, which she hadn't. Long story. But they were married. You have to have a divorce at that point in order to end that marriage. Even though you haven't had your honeymoon, you, know, you haven't gotten to do the things that you want to do on a honeymoon. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. This is when he goes back. 
That's the betrothal. That's when the wheat starts. You follow what I'm saying? It's not the rapture. The rapture is when Messiah comes back. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. That he's going to take us back to his father's house. And again, the disciples didn't get it. Uh, where I, um, and where I go, you know, in the way you know. Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we. how can we get there. They didn't know because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet who was going to testify about Messiah. All of these things started to click later. Do we see this somewhere else? We most certainly do. With me to it, um, Isaiah 26. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arrive. Rapture, the dead rise first. What's Isaiah saying? Along with my dead body. Is it for Jews or Gentiles? It's for believers in Messiah. <laughs> Awake and sing. Remember how we saw that the dead are not dead, they're sleeping? This is when they're going to awake. You know there's an awakening blast? Hey, what do you know? We'll see this what comes up. Awakening blast. Rosh Hashanah. Um... Rosh Hashanah is called the day of the blowing of the shofar to fill the biblical command. It is the awakening blast. Um, the awakening blast, feast of trumpets, Yan Hedin, day of judgment. These are all things we've covered. We looked at Rosh Hashanah. This is when the awakening blast is happens. It is the last trumpet that Paul tells us about. The last trumpet is blown on Rosh Hashanah. It's not blown on Pentecost. Come, my people, enter your chambers. That cha word chambers is bridal chambers, and shut the door behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the wrath has passed, the indignation. So we're hidden away in the bridal chamber. You know, when that bride would come to take, when the groom would come to take his bride back home, um, he'd have to be gone at least a day. Uh, Excuse me, at least a year, but no longer than two years. In scripture, in prophecy, those can be thousands of years. Messiah has to come back within 2,000 years from when he went away. That's the limit. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to publish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth shall disclose her blood and, and will no more cover over her slain. All right. So everybody's going to be talking about Pentecost, right? When is it? What does it mean? Let's look at Pentecost in the Bible. Uh, I just misspelling wrong. I did it again. So the word Pentecost comes up three times. Right. Um, what does the word mean? In the Greek, the fiftieth day. It also tells you it's the second of three great Jewish feasts celebrated in Jerusalem. Yearly, the seventh week after Passover is grateful recognition of the completed harvest. 
the second of three great feast days. What do they mean by the second of three great feast days? Because we know, and there's four in the spring, right? Well, one's in the summer, but there's four in the first coming. There's Passover, unleavened bread, and then the Feast of First Fruits, and then you get to Shavuot. So it's the fourth. Why does this say the second? Well, as we're going to see next week, or the next teaching, we're going to start looking at those feasts. We're going to start looking at the harvest as they relate to the feast. And Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits are three. They're all one. Okay? There are three times. The Shalos Regulin. These are the appointed, excuse me, the times when everybody needs to come to Jerusalem. All the men are required to be there. They are the pilgrimage feasts, and there are three of them. But guess what? Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits are considered one. And then in the fall, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and tabernacles are considered one. So that's how you have three. It encompasses all seven of the feast days that we see in Leviticus 23. One thing, when, when you have those feast days, when everybody has to come to Jerusalem, imagine what the uh, hotels will be like. And unfortunately, you couldn't pick up the phone and call ahead or text them or send an email and make a reservation. They're going to be full. And there will be no room at the end. This gives you a hint as to what time of the year Messiah was born. We'll talk about that. It's important what time of the year he was born. So, when is this 50th day? When do you count from? What does the church say? And then what the church is saying and what scripture says are different. And I'll just leave it at that for now. And I've confronted a couple people here and there. And they say, well, there's two Pentecost. There's one for the church and one for the Jews. Show me that in Scripture. Seriously, show me that in Scripture. Um, I was always taught Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. Here's the question. How... Is Easter, oh, that's not up. How is Easter calculated? Good question. Um, Easter falls on the first Sunday after the full moon date. Based on mathematical calculations, that falls on or after March 21st. If the full moon is on a Sunday, Easter is celebrated on the following Sunday. Although Easter, liturgi liturgically, related to the beginning of the spring in the northern hemisphere, uh, March equinox and a full moon, the date is not based on the actual astronomical date of either event. And it goes through this whole thing. Um, I like this. The, the date of the paschal moon, full moon, Used to determine the date of Easter is based on the mathematical approximations of a 19-year cycle of the, met, the metonic cycle. This is crazy. I can't think of anything in Scripture that talks about this. Can you? Well, let's see where it talks about Easter in the Bible. It doesn't. He's crucified on Passover. And that shows up 78 times. All right. Let me, let's go to Leviticus 23. People say, we don't have the calendar. We most certainly do. You got to understand, Rome changed things. And it's not good. Constantine was a saint, but he's not a saint as we would think of a saint. He's a saint for Lucifer. Yes, I said that. Right. The Sabbath. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations. You proclaim them at appointed times. 
On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. We spoke before about Abib in the last video real quick. Let's go back somewhere. I've done videos about this. Yep. Abib, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And unleavened bread consists of unleavened bread. It consists of Passover and first fruits. In the month of Abib, let's look at what the month of Abib will be. What's that word, Abib? Abib. Fresh young barley ears. Okay, this is the beginning. The, the, in order to start this month, the, the barley has to be almost ready because the um piece of first fruit you're gonna have to shave a sheath of barley before the lord and we'll talk about that soon next video so that's how you start that month it's not based on an equinox you won't find an equinox in scripture all right so you want to still go back all right so that's how you start it so, on the 14th, that's how you find the first month. On the 14th day at the first month um, of twilight is the Lord's Passover. Now you got to, every month, new month starts with a new moon. You have to see the new moon and then start. Everybody assumed April 8th when you had the eclipse was a new moon, because that's what it said on the calendar. They didn't see the new moon until the 8th. So the eclipse did not happen at a new moon. It did not happen at the first of a month on the Jewish calendar. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the next day. On the first day, you should have a holy convocation. Da, 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 da. Let's go down here a little further. I want to wrap this up. The first fruits. When is the first fruits? Um... Say to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheath of the first fruits of the uh, harvest to your priest. He shall wave it before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So it's the day after the Sabbath that follows um, Rosh Hashanah. Excuse me. It's the day after the Sabbath that follows Last ever when Messiah was crucified. It's on a Sunday because it's the day after the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Um, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheath and the wave offering, seven Sabbaths to be completed. And you count 50 days from the day after the Sabbath, the seventh Sabbath, and you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. See, that's because you started um, Jabuot, which is also known as the Feast of Weeks, starts a new, another first fruits. It's the first fruits of the wheat, and we are the wheat. That's when the Holy Spirit's given. That's when people really start to become saved. Ooh, this is really cool when you get it. This is the betrothal. And there's a ketubah given. Promises are given from the bride, from the groom, and from the bride. And we will be looking at that as we go on. I'm not sure if we're going to, the next video is going to be the wedding feast or the harvest. The harvest, we'll see. Thank you so much for joining me. May God bless you.